Well, God bless you. It's a joy to come into your homes. If you're ever in our area, please stop by and be a part of one of our services. I promise you, we'll make you feel right at home. I like to start with something funny. And I heard about this lady that died and she was at the pearly gates and St. Peter said, you can't come in yet. You have to correctly spell a word. She said, what word? He said, any word. So she spelled the word love, L-O-V-E. He said, welcome to heaven. Then Peter asked her if she would take his place for just a moment. He instructed her if anybody came up just to follow the same procedure. A few minutes, she sees her ex-husband walking up. She can't believe it. Says, what are you doing here? He said, I just had a heart attack. Did I really make it to heaven? She said, not yet. You have to spell a word correctly. He said, what word? There was a long pause and she said, Czechoslovakia. (laughs) I want to talk to you today about emptying out the negative. It's easy to go through life holding on to things that are weighing us down. Guilt, resentment, doubt, worry. The problem is when we allow these things in, they're taking up space for the good things that should be there. Imagine your life is like a container. You were created to be filled with joy, peace, confidence, creativity. But if you allow worry in, it pushes out the peace. There's not space for both. You can't go above 100%. You have a limited amount of room. If you allow guilt to take up space, that's space that you don't have for the confidence you need. And the reason some people don't enjoy their lives is because their container, their heart is contaminated with so many things. They have 10% worried, stressed out over their job, 12% bitterness, mad at their neighbor, 20% guilt, beating themselves up for past mistakes, 9% jealousy, their coworker is more beautiful. They don't realize 70% of their container is negative. They wonder why they don't have joy, creativity, passion, They only have room for 30% of what they should have. And the scripture says, give no place to the enemy. It's not just talking about forces of darkness. That means give no place to guilt. Give no place to worry. Give no place to bitterness. It can't come in and automatically take over. You control what's in your container. You control what you think about, what you choose to allow in. And we all have negative emotions, and negative feelings. But you have to make the choice. I'm not going to give this jealousy, this bitterness, this anger, valuable space and let it poison my life. I'm going to protect what I allow in me. And every morning when we wake up, we need to empty out anything negative from the day before. Somebody offended you at work. They didn't treat you right. It's easy to let that offense stay feels good to carry around a grudge, but you have to be disciplined. Say, no, I am not giving this offense any room. I am not going to let it sour my day. They hurt you once. Don't let them continue to hurt you by holding on to the offense. Being offended is not harming them. It's harming you. It's taking up space you need for the good things that move you toward your destiny. Or you wake up in the morning and thoughts of worry come. How are you going to pay your bills? What if the medical report's not good? You'll never get out of this problem. Don't allow that in. Don't make the mistake of dwelling on it. Just say, no, thanks. I know God's in control. He's got me in the palm of his hand. He'll get me to where I'm supposed to be. Take inventory of what you're giving space to. Life is too short to go through it with negative things holding us down. David said in Psalm 103, God fills my life with good things so I stay young and strong. Now, I've learned if you'll empty out the negative, if you'll make room, God will fill you with good things. You empty out the worry, God will fill you with peace. You empty out the insecurity, negative things people have said about you, God will fill you with confidence. My question today is, is God trying to fill you with good things, but there's no room? Your container is full of worry, regret, bitterness, jealousy. Why don't you start emptying that out? Somebody did you wrong. You could hold on to that bitterness. Instead, God, I forgive them. I let it go. You didn't just forgive. You made room for God to fill you with good things. That's when he'll give you beauty for ashes, joy for mourning. 
You're in a tough season. The medical report wasn't good. You should be stressed, worried. Instead, God, I trust you. You said you would restore health back into me. You just made room for God to fill you with healing. You empty out the worry, God will give you peace in the midst of the storm. Perhaps a coworker got the promotion that you worked so hard for. Envy, jealousy will come. I wish that was me. I'm smarter than they are. I don't understand that. Instead of letting that stay, God, I know you're no respecter of persons. You did it for them. I know you can do it for me. The good news is God doesn't run out of favor. He doesn't have a limited supply. If you will empty out the jealousy, then when it's your time to be promoted, God will open doors that no man can shut. And if somebody got what you wanted, that simply means it wasn't supposed to be yours. If they got the promotion, be happy for them. God has something better for you. If they got the man you wanted to date, let's make it real. If they got the girl you were interested in, don't be upset. God knows what he's doing. If it worked out your way, it would be second best. Bottom line, what has your name on it is not going to go to anyone else. Don't go around bitter with jealousy and self-pity. That will poison your life. Empty it out. God is in control. He's directing your steps. And at the right time, what has your name on it will show up. God promises if we will make room, he will not only fill us with good things, but he will keep us young and strong. And the reason some people are not young and strong, and I don't mean just young physically, but young in their spirit, vibrant, passionate about life, is because they're filled with the negative. Worry will make you weak. Living stressed out will make you old, give you wrinkles, take your passion. Being bitter, angry, resentful will shorten your life. Proverbs says a relaxed attitude lengthens life. You can be 80 years old and young at heart. Your spirit never ages. I met a woman in the lobby a while back. It was her 100th birthday. She was standing there dressed impeccably, beautiful, hardly had any wrinkles, full of joy. Her mind was as sharp as can be. I asked her what her secret was so I could tell Victoria... <laughs> She said, I don't worry, I let things go, and I laugh a lot. She's lived by this principle. You know in a hundred years she's had trouble, people have hurt her, she's made mistakes, life has happened, offenses have come, but she hasn't held on to them. She's kept emptying them out, and like God promised, he's filled her life with good things, kept her young and strong. I don't want to get old, grouchy, grumpy, fall apart. I want to stay young, strong, good looking, full of faith and joy and energy. The way this happens is give no place to the negative. Get in a habit of emptying out the offenses, empty out the worry. You make a mistake, empty out the guilt. You didn't do your best, empty out the regret. Do better next time. Nobody gave you credit, empty out the self-pity. You had a bad break. You don't understand it. Empty out the questions. If you'll get good at emptying out the negative, you'll be like this lady, strong, young, vibrant, full of faith, and full of joy. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. That word pure in the original language is where we get our word cathartic. It means cleansing, releasing. If you have surgery, sometimes the doctor will put in a catheter, same root word. It's a tube that drains out the impurities of the body. You can't get up to use the facility. That catheter automatically takes what's not beneficial, the toxins, the infections, the waste, and flushes them out of the body. The doctor knows there will be contaminants. He's not alarmed that the body has waste and infection. He's only alarmed when it's not being released, when we're holding on to things that should be flushed out. When God says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's saying you're going to be blessed when you learn how to release the impurities of life. When you get in a habit like this catheter of emptying out things that will infect you. 
You know what bitterness is to our spirit? It's infection. Guilt is infection. Worry, doubt, self-pity. These things are not unusual. Impurities come. You have to push them out. It's when we hold on to them that it contaminates our spirit and causes us problems. You weren't created to carry around guilt, regret, bitterness, anger that poisons your life. Well, Joel, I'm bitter because I had a bad break. I'm sour because somebody walked out on me. I say this respectfully. That's simply an impurity. Why don't you release it so it doesn't infect the rest of your life? Don't let a disappointment, a divorce, a layoff, a loss poison your future. Well, Joel, I'm worried about my health, worried about my finances, worried about my children. Worry is a part of life. Those thoughts come to us all. The key is to not hold on to them. Recognize they're not beneficial. They're not moving you forward. That's an impurity that wasn't meant to stay. You have to release it. God, I don't see a way, but I know you're still on the throne. I know you're bigger than this problem. I know you're supplying all of my needs. You just released the toxin. Are you holding on to infection, to impurities, angry, jealous, worried, discouraged? Maybe you had a disappointment. Something didn't work out. Imagine there's an angel that has a delivery with your name on it. It says beauty for ashes, new beginning, new opportunities, new friendships. He's en route with one of those good things. The problem is if you're holding on to the old, there's no place for him to deliver it. I wonder how many things are en route right now. The angel is standing by with our joy, our peace, our confidence, our creativity, our spouse, but because there's no room, because we're not releasing the toxins, the anger, the bitterness, the jealousy, the worry, then he can't deliver those good things. Instead of living blessed, excited about our future, we become infected. The good news is you can get rid of that infection. It is not permanent. If you'll start releasing the regret the worry, the bitterness, the anger, then it's just a matter of time before that angel shows up with your delivery. When you make room, God promises he will fill your life with good things. This is what David did. He was an expert at emptying out the negative. His family looked down on him, treated him like he was second class. He could have let that infection take root, lived insecure. Instead, he let it go in one ear and out the other. He knew if he held on to it, it would keep him from his destiny. David went to the palace, served faithfully King Saul. He would play the harp when Saul was sick to make him feel better. In return, Saul tried to kill him. Saul was jealous of David and chased him through the desert, made him his life miserable. David could have become bitter thought, what's the use? Everybody's against me. Life is not fair. Instead, he kept his heart pure and emptied out the self-pity. Like David, we all have impurities, infections that come, people come against us. Our plans don't always work out. It's easy to think, why is this happening? It's just life. The scripture says offenses will come. They're not a problem unless you don't know what to do with them. Too many people make the mistake of hold on to them. They get bitter, live guilty with a chip on their shoulder. That's going to poison your future. You have to release the toxins of life. You may not be able to keep them from coming, but you can keep them from staying. David had a pure heart. That means he kept the infections out. It doesn't mean that he was perfect. David made mistakes. One time he committed adultery and had the lady's husband killed. For one year, he tried to cover it up, swept it under a rug. He was so overwhelmed with guilt, condemnation, that he became sick and weak. That poison started to infect his life. He finally admitted his mistake. He repented, asked God to forgive him, and things began to turn around. Once he got the infection out, then his health was restored. When you make a mistake, and we all do, 
Don't run away from God. Don't try to hide it. Go to God. Repent. That means don't keep doing the same thing. And then ask for forgiveness. And here's the key. You have to receive God's mercy. The enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. He'll remind you of every mistake you've made for the last 30 years. And it's easy to live life in regrets, thinking about what you should have done differently. Man, I should have raised my children better. Should have been more faithful in my marriage. I should have finished college. Don't go through life looking in the rearview mirror, down on yourself, living in regrets. You can't do anything about the past, but you can do something about right now. Being against yourself doesn't help you do better. It pushes you down. The moment you ask God to forgive you, he forgave you. Why don't you forgive yourself? Why don't you empty out the guilt? Why don't you turn off the accusing voices? God doesn't remember your mistakes anymore. If someone is bringing up the negative things of your past, it's not God. That's the accuser trying to deceive you into living condemned. How much space are you given to guilt, to shame, to regret, to being against yourself? Whatever it is, it's too much. You need that space for the good things God has to move you toward your destiny. If you're giving space to guilt, you will not have the confidence you need to move forward. That will cause you to fail again. It's a negative cycle. The only way you can break it is to rise up and say, that's it. I am done living in the past, focused on my mistakes, reliving my failures, beating myself up. This is a new day. I'm emptying out all that infection. I'm going to receive God's mercy. You have to do this by faith because every voice will tell you, you're a hypocrite. God's not going to forgive you. Look what you've done doesn't have anything to do with what you have or haven't done. It has to do with what Jesus has already done. But Joel, I made a lot of mistakes. I don't deserve to be blessed. None of us deserve it. This is what mercy is all about. That's why it's called the good news. Your sins have already been forgiven. You don't have to pay God back for your mistakes. The price has already been paid. When you fall down, don't stay down. Get back up again. When the accuser whispers, look at you, you blew it again. You'll never get it right. Just answer back, yes, I know I'm not perfect, but I am forgiven. I may not be where I should be, but I'm making progress. I'm moving forward. I'm not where I used to be. Don't let guilt poison your future. Empty it out. Sometimes it's hard to empty out the negative. When a person does us wrong, human nature wants to hold on to the hurt, become bitter, carry around a grudge. We think, I'm not going to forgive them. They don't deserve it. But you're not forgiving for their sake. You're forgiving for your sake. As long as you hold on to the hurt, the anger, the bitterness, it's not affecting them. It's infecting you. Unforgiveness is like a poisonous toxin. It may feel good to hold on to it, but it will contaminate your life. Now, a lot of times the reason we don't forgive is because what the other person does was wrong. They were clearly at fault. But when you forgive, you're not excusing their behavior. You're not lessening the offense. You're simply getting the poison out of you. You have to forgive so you can be free. Quit looking at it like you're doing them a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. See, it takes a lot of emotional energy to hold a grudge, to live with unforgiveness, you wake up, it's always on your mind, thinking about how they did you wrong. You may not realize you are spending emotional energy that you need for your dreams, for your goals, for your children. You won't become all you were created to be if you are wasting emotional energy on things that don't matter. That unforgiveness is an impurity. Yes, what they did was wrong, but you have to let it pass. You have to release it. When you do, you'll not only feel a new freedom, not only have more energy, but God will be your vindicator. He will make your wrongs right. You don't have to pay people back. You're not the judge. God is. Leave it up to him and he'll vindicate you better than you could vindicate yourself. This is what a lady did named Mary Johnson. 
She was the single mother of one son. When he was 20 years old, he was out late one night at a party. This young man came up that he had never met. His name was Oshi. He was 16 years old and had been drinking. There was an altercation. In the heat of the moment, Oshi pulled out a gun and shot Mary's only son. He was instantly killed. Mary was so filled with anger and hatred, she told the judge that 16-year-old boy was an animal and he needed to be caged. When he was only charged with second-degree murder, Mary was even more angry. She became a recluse, stayed in her house, wouldn't look at her son's picture. Ten years passed. She knew it was time to forgive. She could hear the still small voice telling her to let it go. She contacted the prison to see if she could visit Oshi. They said yes, but Oshi said no. He wouldn't do it. She kept asking and asking. Finally, he agreed. She showed up at the prison. When she saw Oshi, he came around and gave her a big hug and held on to her. They wept and wept. Mary said, as I was embracing Oshi, I could feel hatred and bitterness rising up out of me and leaving my body. It was so strong that she fell over. Oshi had to hold her up. That day, Mary not only emptied out the unforgiveness, but she found a new son. Seven years later, Oshi was released on parole, didn't have any place to live. Mary said, you can live next door to me. She calls him her spiritual son. Mary started an organization called From Death to Life to help mothers who have lost children to violence. Now she and Moshe go out and speak at conferences and schools about unforgiveness and overcoming loss. Mary said what really helped her decide to forgive was a poem she heard about two mothers in heaven that had just become friends. One mother asked the other, who is your son? She said, my son is Jesus, I'm Mary. Mary asked, who is your son? She said, my son is Judas. When Mary Johnson heard how in this poem, Mary the mother of Christ had befriended the mother of Judas, she knew she had to reach out to that other family. Now she helps other mothers do the same thing. Out of your pain can come your purpose. I saw a lady on television recently Several years earlier, her son had been killed in an accident. They asked her how she was doing, and she made the statement, you never really get over it, but you can get past it. She was saying, yes, it's difficult. Yes, there was a season of mourning, but you don't have to stay in mourning. You don't have to live bitter. You don't have to get stuck in grief, in depression. You can move forward. When you go through a loss, Things happen you don't understand. It's easy to think, I just need to get over this. But sometimes that's too strong. It can put more pressure on us. We think, why do I feel this way? I must be doing something wrong. Take the pressure off. You don't have to get over it. Just get past it. Just keep moving forward, taking it one day at a time. God said he will never give you something that you cannot handle. You may not understand why it happened, but the scripture says, God will give us a peace that passes understanding. You're not going to figure everything out. If you'll let go of the questions of life, you will have a peace that goes beyond what you can understand. Toward the end of Jesus' life, he'd been betrayed by a disciple, mocked by the soldiers, falsely accused. Now he was hanging on the cross, wearing a crown of thorns, about to breathe his last breath. He did something significant. He could have just died and went on to heaven. That was it. But he said, Father, before I go, I need to take care of one last thing. Forgive them for they know not what they do. They didn't ask for forgiveness. They didn't deserve it. Jesus was saying, in effect, I'm not going to leave this earth with anything negative in me. He was showing us by example how we should release the toxins, release the impurities. I read where Leonardo da Vinci was painting a portrait of Christ. He let some small children in the room to watch him paint. One of them accidentally knocked over the easel. 
He became very upset and ushered them out of the room. He sat back down to finish, but he said he could not paint the face of Christ with anger in his heart. That's what happens when we hold on to the negative. It stifles our creativity. We don't do our best work. It's because there's infection that's slowing us down. Are you allowing negative things in your container? To reach the fullness of your destiny, you need to operate at your maximum potential. If you have a little bitterness, a little guilt, a little jealousy, a little worry, if you add up all the space the little is taking, you're only operating at a fraction of what you could. I'm asking you to empty all that out. God is ready to fill your life with good things. He wants to keep you young and strong. Do your part and make room for him. Every morning, empty out the guilt, empty out the worry, empty out the discouragement. And when the impurities come, when the infection come, don't let it stay. Let it pass on through. Keep your heart pure. If you do this, I believe and declare you're going to step up to a new level with more joy, more peace, more favor, healing, wholeness, the fullness of your destiny in Jesus' name. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church and keep God first place. Your partnership. God bless you. It's a joy to be with you. And if you're ever in our area, please stop by, be a part of one of our services. I promise you, we'll make you feel right at home. But I like to start with something funny. And I heard about this man. He was sitting on an airplane next to a beautiful single lady. They struck up a conversation. and He asked her what kind of men she liked. She said, well, I like Native American men with their high cheekbones and golden tan skin. Plus, I like Jewish men. They're so brilliant and successful. And I like good old boys from the South with their long Southern drawl. What's your name? He said, my name is Geronimo Bernstein, but my friends call me Bubba. <laughs> Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I want to talk to you today about faith for the middle. It's easy to have faith at the start. When that new baby is born, you marry that beautiful girl, you start that business, that's exciting. There's adrenaline flowing. It's easy to have faith at the end. When you can see the finish line, the dream is in sight, you fought the good fight. Having faith at the start and faith at the end is no problem. The real challenge is having faith in the middle. When it's taking longer than you thought, when you don't have the funds, when the medical report wasn't good, that little baby you were so excited about, he was so cute, he couldn't do any wrong, now he's a teenager. You're convinced he's not your child. You're having his DNA tested next week. The mistake we make is we get discouraged in the middle. We think, God, I know you gave me this child, but he's making my life miserable. God, you brought this spouse into my life, but there's conflict. God, you blessed me with this business, but I don't have the funds I need to run it. In the middle is where most people lose the battle. But God never promised that we would reach our destiny without opposition, without disappointments, without things we don't understand. And the scripture says, don't think it's strange when you face fiery trials. That means don't be upset because that person did you wrong. Don't start worrying because business went down. God is still on the throne. Nothing that's happened to you has stopped his plan for your life. He's not in the heavens scratching his head, thinking, oh man, that one threw me off. 
I didn't see that bad break coming. What God promised you, he still has every intention of bringing it to pass. Now I know you can have faith at the start. I know you can have faith at the end. My question is, will you have faith for the middle? When it's not happening the way you thought, when it seems like you're going backwards, every voice tells you to give up. You must have heard God wrong. You wouldn't have this opposition if you were on the right course. Don't believe those lies. It's all a part of the process. Here's the key. When God puts a dream in your heart, he'll show you the end. He gives you the promise, but he won't show you the middle. If he told us all it was going to take to see it come to pass, many times we would talk ourselves out of it. In the scripture, an angel appeared to a young teenage girl named Mary. He said, Mary, you are highly favored of God. You're going to have a baby without knowing a man. He will be the Messiah, the savior of the world. God showed her the end. She was going to be the mother of Christ, have honor and be respected and admired for generations to come. And I'm sure Mary was excited. She couldn't believe it was happening. But years later, I can hear Mary saying, God, you didn't tell me having this baby would cause my fiance to want to call off the engagement. You didn't tell me I would have this baby in a manger with smelly animals. You didn't tell me I would have to live on the run two years trying to hide my baby from King Herod. You didn't tell me my son would be mistreated, mocked, ridiculed. I'd have to watch him be crucified, die a painful death. What am I saying? God doesn't give us all the details. What you're facing may be difficult. You don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. This is where your faith has to kick in. Are you going to get discouraged and talk yourself out of it? Or are you going to do like Mary and say, God, you didn't tell me that these people would do me wrong. You didn't tell me I'd be dealing with this illness. You didn't tell me business would slow, but God, I know you're still on the throne. This is not a surprise to you. It's a part of the process. So I'm not going to live discouraged. I'm not going to give up on my dreams. I'm going to do like Mary and have faith for the middle. This is what Joseph did. God gave him a dream that he would rule a nation, that his brothers would bow down before him. God showed him the end. The promise was planted in his heart, but what God didn't show him was the middle. Years later, when Joseph was ruling the nation of Egypt, one of the most influential people of his day, the dream had come to pass. I can imagine Joseph saying, God, you told me that I would take the throne but you didn't tell me my brothers would be jealous and throw me into a pit. You showed me the kingdom, but you didn't show me along the way I would be sold into slavery. You didn't tell me I'd be falsely accused and put in prison for something that I didn't do. If Joseph were here today, he would tell you, don't get discouraged in the middle. Don't give up when life doesn't make sense. You know the promise is in your heart. You know God has told you that you'll be healthy again, that you'll see your family restored, that you'll meet the person of your dreams. But every circumstance may say just the opposite. Looks like you're going the other direction. Do like Joseph. Keep believing. Keep being your best. God has not brought you this far to leave you. He hasn't failed you in the past. He's not going to fail you in the future. Don't get discouraged by the process. See, the start is fun, the end is exciting, but the middle can be messy. And in some way, we're all in the middle. We're all on a journey. There are things that you're believing for. You know God has planted that seed. But over time, it's easy to get discouraged and think, oh, Joel, it's never gonna happen. There are too many obstacles. God has you hearing this to breathe new life into your dreams. What he's promised you is already in route. The process has already been started. The healing, the right people, the new business, the breakthrough is already on the way. Now do your part and have faith for the middle. David could have said, God, you promised me I would be the king, but you didn't tell me I would have to face a giant twice my size. You left that detail out. 
You didn't tell me King Saul would chase me through the desert and try to kill me. You didn't tell me my own son would turn on me and try to take the throne. When you study the great heroes of faith, one common denominator you'll find is they had faith for the middle. When it looked impossible, when the promise seemed a long way off, they kept moving forward knowing that it was a part of the process. I can still remember where I was sitting years ago in a restaurant when a friend of mine told me that the Houston Rockets basketball team was going to move out of the compact center and this facility was going to come available. When I heard that, something came alive on the inside. I knew it was supposed to be ours. God showed me the end. I could already see us in here having services touching the world. But looking back now, I realize what God didn't show me that it was going to take two years to try to convince 10 city council members to vote for us. He didn't show me one of the largest companies in Texas would file a lawsuit to try to keep us from moving in. He didn't tell me it was going to cost $100 million to renovate. Sometimes God leaves out certain details on purpose. If he would have told me I would be responsible for those funds, I would have said, God, we're fine with our old location. I would have settled for less than his best. There's a reason we don't know all the details. We wouldn't move into the fullness of our destiny because none of us like adversity. We like to be comfortable, but you won't become all you were created to be without opposition, without disappointments, without struggles that cause you to stretch your faith, to grow, to develop your spiritual muscles. When God brought the Israelites out of slavery, they were headed toward the promised land. God showed them the destination, the land flowing with milk and honey. He got them started, but in the middle, God didn't abandon them. He didn't say, I gave you the promise. Now you're on your own. Good luck in the middle. No, all along the way, God supernaturally provided for them. He gave them manna, something like bread to eat each morning out in the desert. When they wanted meat, God shifted the direction of the winds and hundreds of thousands of quail came into the camp. When they were thirsty and couldn't find a stream, God brought water out of a rock. He protected them from enemies that were much bigger and more powerful. When Pharaoh changed his mind and came chasing after the Israelites, they were at a dead end at the Red Sea. and They had nowhere to go. It looked like they were done. God supernaturally parted the waters, took them through on dry ground. Again and again, God showed them favor, made things happen that they could never make happen. God was showing us I'm not just the God of the start. I'm not just the God of the finish. I'm the God of the middle. I'm the God who will bring you through the storm, through the trial, through the difficulty. When you're in the middle, God's given you the promise. Like the Israelites, you know your destination, but you're in route, raising that baby, believing for your healing. You're running your business. Along the way, you'll face situations like them where it looks impossible. The odds are against you. The opposition is much stronger. Be encouraged. The God of the middle is right there with you. And there may be some red seas in your path. Seems like you're stuck. The good news is God knows how to part the waters. He knows how to make a way. You may not have the funds you need to go to college, to run your business, but God knows how to shift the direction of the winds and bring quail into your camp, so to speak. God can still bring water out of a rock. Don't give up in the middle. The scripture says, you'll go through the flood, but you will not drown. Why is that? The God of the middle is with you. Goes on to say, you'll go through the fire, but you won't be burned. You'll go through the famine, but you won't go hungry. You may be in the fire, in the flood, in the famine, God is saying, you're not staying there, you're going through it. And when you're in the middle, you have to remind yourself, this too shall pass. It's temporary. Now quit giving so much energy to something that's not going to last. Quit wasting time worried about the situation at work. 
discouraged over the medical report, upset over what they said. That's not your destination. You're only passing through. The trouble is not permanent. The sickness, the legal situation, the loneliness, it's just a step along the way. But if you make the mistake of letting it overwhelm you and get discouraged, then you'll settle there and let what should have been temporary become permanent. This is where many people miss it. They give up in the middle. I'm asking you to keep moving forward. David said it this way, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say, I stay in the valley. I set up camp in the valley. I build my house in the valley. He said, the valley is not my home. I don't settle in the middle. I don't get discouraged by opposition. I don't give up when life doesn't make sense. He had faith for the middle. When things come against you, you're tempted to settle. You have to dig your heels in and say like David, I know he's not just the God of the finish. He's the God of the middle. So I'm not going to settle in the valley. I'm not going to get stuck in the middle. I'm going to keep moving forward, knowing that God will get me to where I'm supposed to be. This is what it says in Psalm 138. The Lord will work out his plan for your life. Doesn't say we have to work out our own plan, make it happen in our own strength, be frustrated when it's not happening the way we thought. No, we can stay in peace knowing that the Lord, the God who created the universe, the God who spoke worlds into existence, he's promised he will work out his plan for your life. And sometimes it does feel like we're going backwards. We know we should be going that way. We're going just the opposite, but God knows what he's doing. His ways are better than our ways. Right now, he's behind the scenes in your life working out his plans. That means he's arranging things in your favor. He's moving the wrong people out of the way. He's lining up the breaks you need. You may not see anything yet. You have to walk by faith and not by sight. See, in the middle, Joseph could have said, it's never going to work out. I'm a slave in prison, in a foreign land. You're telling me I'm going to rule a nation? What Joseph couldn't see was behind the scenes, God was working out the plan for his life. In the middle, David could have said, I'll never take the throne. I'm a shepherd boy from a low-income family. I don't have the talent, the connections, the experience, but God is not dependent on what you don't have. When he breathed his life into you, he equipped you with everything that you need. What you think you don't have enough of, the favor of God will make up for it. His anointing on your life will cause you to go further than people that have more talent than you do. In the middle, Abraham could have said, we'll never have a baby. That's impossible. We're too old. But what he couldn't see was behind the scenes. God had already ordained a little baby named Isaac that had Abraham and Sarah's name on it. You may not see how your dream could come to pass. Medically speaking, you won't get well. Doesn't look like you'll ever break that addiction. On your own, you're out of luck. The good news is you're not on your own. You're not doing life by yourself. Your heavenly father, the most high God, is working out his plans for your life. And there may be some obstacles that look insurmountable, but God has the final say. When you have faith for the middle, God will make things happen that you could never make happen. He'll turn situations around that look impossible. He'll take you further than you've imagined. Paul said in Ephesians, put on the armor of God so in the day of trouble, you can stand. In life, we will all have days of trouble, days of disappointments, days of opposition. But the same God that said there will be a day of trouble also said there will be a day when that trouble comes to an end. You may be in a difficulty right now. Be encouraged, it's temporary. That trouble has an expiration date. God has already set an end to it. You're in the middle, but at the appointed time, the end will come. That legal situation, it's just one of those days of trouble that God talked about. Instead of being discouraged, keep reminding yourself this trouble is not permanent. It has an expiration date. 
Just like there's a day of trouble, God has a day of deliverance, a day of healing, a day of abundance, a day of breakthroughs. This couple I know have a son that was addicted to drugs for over 20 years. These parents are good people. They love God. They're always giving and serving, but somehow their son got on the wrong course. Year after year went by, looked like nothing was changing. But I never heard these parents talk about the problem. I never once heard them complain, God, why did this happen to our son? We don't understand it. They were in the valley, but they didn't make the valley their home. They knew just as there was a day of trouble when their son was addicted, there was a day of deliverance set by the creator of the universe where their son would be free from that addiction. And they had done everything they could. They prayed, they believed, they sent him to rehab, but none of that worked. A few months ago, some people that worked with this young man took a special interest in him. They're not even believers, but they befriended him and paid his way to go through treatment. This time it was successful. Now for the first time in over 20 years, he's completely clean. He has no desire for any of those drugs. What happened? He came in to his day of deliverance. What his parents couldn't do, God had somebody to do for him. When you have faith for the middle, God will make things happen that you could never make happen. You may be in one of those days of trouble right now. Trouble in your health, trouble in a relationship, trouble in your mind. It's easy to think it's never going to change. I'll always be depressed. I'll always struggle in my finances, always struggle with this addiction. You need to get ready like this young man. God is saying, your day of deliverance is coming. Your day of freedom, your day of joy, your day of victory is on the way. Mark chapter four, Jesus had been teaching thousands of people. It was late in the day. He said to the disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. They got in a boat and began to travel there. But along the way, they encountered a huge storm. The scripture describes it as a furious squall of hurricane proportions. The winds were so strong, they thought the boat was going to capsize. The waves were coming up over the top. The disciples were so panicked that Peter ran down to the stern of the boat where Jesus was sleeping and said, Jesus, wake up. We're in the middle of the storm. We're about to die. Jesus woke up and he spoke to the storm and everything calmed down. What's interesting is Jesus knew there was going to be a storm before they left that night. He's God. He knows everything. Why did he tell them, let's go to the other side if he knew there was going to be a hurricane, a major storm? Because he also knew that storm could not keep them from their destiny. He knew there would be difficulties in the middle, but when he declares, we're going to the other side, All the forces of darkness cannot stop him. He's going to make it to the other side. In the same way, when God puts a promise in your heart, when he speaks into your destiny, you don't have to be moved by the winds, worried by the storms, upset and panicked because there's a few hurricanes along the journey. God is in control of the universe. What he's spoken over your life will come to pass. And the reason Jesus didn't wake up on his own in the middle of that storm is because he knew the disciples could handle it. If they were all going to die, he would have gotten up without them having to wake him up. When we're in a storm, a lot of times we do like Peter and we get all upset, panic. God, you got to help me. God, you got to fix this right now. The reason it may seem like God is not waking up is not because he's ignoring you, not because he's uninterested. It's because he knows you can handle it. He wouldn't have allowed that storm if it was going to sink you. Now quit being upset over something you can handle. Quit worrying about that situation at work. God is not ignoring you. He knew there'd be a storm before he sent you out. He's not waking up because he's growing you up. He's teaching you to have faith for the middle. If he came running, every time we had a difficulty, our spiritual muscles would never develop. We would never really trust him. 
But when you're calm, despite what comes against you, that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign you have faith for the middle. If God is not turning it around yet, the winds are still blowing, the waves are still rocking, take it as a compliment. That means you can handle it. It's not too much for you. You have the most powerful force in the universe breathing in your direction. Years ago, we were doing a night of hope in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium. Alexandra, our daughter, was a little girl. She would come up at the end of the program and sing. There were thousands of people there. It was live on television. Alexandra started her song, but the mic wasn't working properly. It would come on for a second, go off for three seconds, cutting in and out. It's hard enough to sing in the big stadiums because there's so much echo, but now she couldn't hear herself. and She was a little girl and didn't really know what to do. As she was singing with these thoughts of confusion filling her mind saying, you should stop. Nobody can hear you. You're wasting your time. She looked over to the left and could see Victoria, her mother, sitting on the side of the platform. The whole time, Victoria had a big smile on her face and was nodding her head yes, just like she was saying, keep going. You're doing good. Alexandra would sing for another 15 seconds, Mike cutting in and out. She would look back over and there was Victoria, still smiling from ear to ear, nodding her head yes. Alexandra made it through the whole song simply because she could see her mother reassuring her that everything was going to be all right. And sometimes in life, the mic is not working. You're in the middle of your song. You thought it would be the best part of your life, but you came down with an illness. Somebody walked away and broke your heart. The business didn't make it. You hit one of those days of trouble. Every voice will tell you to stop singing. It's not making a difference. Nobody's listening. But if you'll look up through your eyes of faith, you'll see your heavenly father nodding his head yes, saying, keep going. You're doing good. I'm in control. When you're in the middle and the mic quits working, the key is just keep singing your song. Keep doing the right thing. You can't control everything that happens to you. Just be your best and trust God to take care of the rest. He's not just the God of the start, not just the God of the finish. He's the God of the middle. He has you in the palm of his hand. He's behind the scenes right now working out his plan for your life. Don't be discouraged by the process. You may be in the fire, but you're not staying there. You're passing through. You're coming out. And I believe and declare, if you'll have faith for the middle, the God of the middle is going to show up and show out in your life. Like the Israelites, providing for you, protecting you, and you won't get stuck in the middle. You will make it in to your promised land. In Jesus' name, if you receive it, can you say amen today? I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church. Your partnership makes... 